Strange Studies of Strange Stories. The last question was asked for the first time, half in jest, on May 21st, 2061, at a time when humanity first stepped into the light. The question came about as a result of a $5 bet over highballs, and it happened this way. Alexander Adele and Bertram Lupov were two of the faithful attendants of Multivac. As well as any human beings could, they knew what lay behind the cold, clicking, flashing face, miles and miles of face, of that giant computer. They had at least a vague notion of the general plan of relays and circuits that had long since grown past the point where any single human could possibly have a firm grasp on the whole. Multivac was self-adjusting and self-correcting. It had to be, for nothing human could adjust and correct it quickly enough or even adequately enough. So Adele and Lupov attended the monstrous giant only lightly and superficially, yet as well as any men could. They fed it data, adjusted questions to its needs, and translated the answers that were issued. Certainly, they and all others like them were fully entitled to share in the glory that was Multivax. I know the Multivac is an insanely powerful supercomputer, but I just kept thinking of an all-purpose vacuum cleaner. I did too, of course. My first question of the episode, what is the story? This is The Last Question by Isaac Asimov. Ah, so that's what was playing at the beginning of this episode. It was not a voice I was hearing in my head. Whose voice was it that we were all hearing? That's our reader, Ryan Negron. A triumphant comeback. I believe we roped Ryan in previously when we covered those Farnsworth Wright stories on HP Podcraft. And we just covered some Farnsworth Wright, we think, writing as Houdini last week. Yes, yes. So there's a little connective thread there. Ryan was just cast in a new show by Studio Bones. That's the studio that made Cowboy Bebop. It's called Metallic Rogue, and Ryan will be voicing the character Noid262. Sounds like a character from today's story. Keep a watch out (laughs) for that. And we also have a sponsor this week, isn't that right? Yes, this month's sponsor is a 24-hour Lovecraftian immersive theater experience called the key of dreams. Rachel and I had the pleasure of doing their last experience, which was called Locksmith's Dream, and it was one of the coolest things that I've ever done. Oh. Takes place in a South Wales manor house called Treowen. You are actually in South Wales. That's where this is located. Yes, yeah. Rachel and I drove to South Wales out into the country. There's this big manor house, totally amazing. They're servants that are really actors, but they're actually servants because they do bring you things and help oh. you out. Do they dress you? They don't dress you. Wow. No, you do that on your own. I'll write a note for them to put that in the key of dreams. <laughs> But what's so cool about it is you interact with the characters and the story unfolds and you solve mysteries and multiple mysteries. Mm -hmm. And then also there's this narrative that's going on that you help shape by whatever it is that you do. I make it fun a little bit, but I would love to do this. And it's 24 hours. So you sleep there Mm -hmm. in this place. The accommodations are amazing. The staff was awesome. The food was insane. A big part of the experience is a drama that plays out over a seven course meal that you're having. Oh, man. There's events going on April 29th. May 4th, there's two in October, on October 24th and the 26th. Check out their website, thekeyofdreams.co.uk. Now let's get on to the story, The Last Question. We chose The Last Question for this month because it was one of Asimov's favorite stories of those that he wrote. It was first published in the November 1956 issue of Science Fiction Quarterly. This is what he had to say about it. Why is it my favorite? For one thing, I got the idea all at once and didn't have to fiddle with it, and I wrote it in white heat and scarcely had to change a word. This sort of thing endears any story to any writer. Then, too, it has had the strangest effect on my readers. Frequently someone writes to me if I can give them the name of a story, which they think I may have written, and tell them where to find it. They don't remember the title, but when they describe the story, it is invariably the last question. This has reached the point where I recently received a long-distance phone call from a desperate man who began, Dr. Asimov, there's a story I think you wrote whose title I can't remember, at which point I interrupted to tell him it was the last question. And when I described the plot, it proved to be indeed the story he was after. (laughs) I left him convinced I could read minds at a distance of a thousand miles. The story begins in the year 2061. We have these two guys, Alexander and Bertram, who work on this supercomputer called the Multivac. They don't do much because the computer is a self-teaching computer and it also fixes itself. They guide it more than anything. By 2061, humanity has spread through part of the solar system, but it's limited by the amount of fuel that it takes to get beyond Mars. The computer being named Multivac, it's possibly, and maybe even likely that it's a long acronym like RADAR, 
But it being the 1950s when innovation in household appliances was all the rage, maybe this thing did evolve from a sophisticated vacuum. In some of my reading, they talked about computers and technology at this time using vacuum tubes. Oh, you think it's the vacuum tubes? Yeah. So much of our technology is named because eventually it would have gotten rid of the vacuum tubes, right? But oh, it yeah. still would be called that. Sort of like we do a podcast that most people do not listen to on iPods. Yeah. Eventually they might wonder why it was ever called a podcast. Right. We go to the movies, which is referencing still photos. <laughs> Whoever thinks when they show up at the theater, they're going to accidentally just be staring at a photo for an hour, you know. <laughs> We don't need to call out that they move anymore. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Maybe this is a self-guiding vacuum, I thought, and the AI that they used to guide it wound up having that extra special little thing that they went, oh, it's thinking in a way that we can scale and make it better. So that was the backstory in my uh, mind. But I think more likely than not, it was the vacuum tubes. But yours, were, yours is better. Well, it's a lot of drugs that are effective at this and that. Initially, it was a side effect of them trying to treat something else. So I thought maybe this right. was a similar thing. I also love the idea that it's already a scary alien thing. Nothing human could adjust and correct it quickly enough or even adequately enough. Mm -hmm. It's already passed out of human understanding. And these guys who tend to it are more like priests at a temple. Yeah. They couldn't fix anything real. Just this year, the multivac, at the prompting of Alex and Bertram, has figured out a way to harness the sun's energy and get the planet off fossil fuels. And I thought this was interesting and a bit like AI art, Alex and Bertram get praised for asking the right questions, but they didn't really come up with the solar power solution. The multivac did. Hmm. Just like people who type in prompts into mid-journey aren't really doing any of the work, but they're taking credit for it. Yeah, that's a tricky one, too, because what are they supposed to do then to continue the religiosity and say, all glory to the multivac uh, yeah, I don't and know. not take personal credit? In a certain respect, they're just the representatives of humanity to reassure everybody that we still have a a hand in this. We ask the questions. <laughs> AI art gets a lot of press. Oh, yeah. I, I do think that I wish there was more press given to the ways that AI could benefit us. Similar to this. Mm -hmm. You know, I read about a scientist and forgive me if the details aren't right, but she had waxworms in a plastic bag that she was going to use for another experiment and waxworms, which can eat anything, ate through the bag. So they were able to digest plastic what? and turn it into, you know, non-harmful waste. Whoa. So they are trying to figure out how can they scale this because something's going on in waxworm biology that allows this to happen right, and right. we could use it to clean up the oceans. Well, there are a kajillion, and that's a scientific term, <laughs> enzymes within the worm that might be res you know, responsible for this. Right. And they don't know which it is. So combining and recombining them turns out to be just a, a marathon process. They need a lot of funding, a lot of scientists, et cetera, except an AI could do it. Right and get us to the solution faster. So these are the kinds of things that people need to be thinking That's about. True. It, it is the questions you ask. Mm -hmm. If you're turning the AI to make me look at a vampire Ronald McDonald, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> but you've wasted it. <laughs> Waxworms, my boy. The question is important. Back to the story. There's a lot of hoopla, and Alex and Bertram get a bit famous. So much so that they have to hide in the recesses of the multivac to get some privacy to just have a drink with one another. This party is raging because this computer has just solved energy. Yeah. It, in effect, solved climate change, erased the need for fossil fuels. This stuff is renewable. It'll never end. It's the dream. Mm -hmm. The energy of the sun was stored, converted, and utilized directly on a planet-wide scale. All Earth turned off its burning coal, its fissioning uranium, and flipped the switch that connected all of it to a small station, one mile in diameter, circling the Earth at half the distance of the moon. All Earth ran by invisible beams of sun power. <laughs> As they drink and talk, Alex says that it's amazing that, thanks to the solar-powered solution, the Earth has energy forever. And Bertram quickly corrects him and says, well, not forever. Hmm. The sun is going to burn out in 10 billion years or so. The whole universe is moving to heat death, and there's no stopping it. So stories always have an action or plot component, and if they're really good... They also have a sort of spiritual component. And this moment here, mm. this is the spiritual aspect of the story. It's the basic problem of being human. When I say spiritual, I mean it concerns our own sense of what our purpose and identity is. And it speaks to our inability to be satisfied in the present. These guys have just solved the energy problem yeah, or been a part of it. If there's a party to be present at, this is the one. <laughs> you really did it, guys. Enjoy it. But they can't. Yeah. This stuff that they're talking about isn't even going to affect them. Oh, God, no. Or any generation of their own family. Even though we won't see it, things will still end. They need to be able to control that somehow, too, or they can't be satisfied with their present. 
And that is the real problem with the people in this story. Alex says that maybe someday humanity can figure out a way to stop the heat death of the universe. He then suggests that they ask the multivac. Bertram bets him $5 that it cannot be done. There is no solution for this. So he asks the question, how can the net amount of entropy of the universe be massively decreased? And the multivac spits out the answer, insufficient data for meaningful answer. Hmm. Bertrand says, no bet, and they leave. The next day, they both have to nurse some serious hangovers. The multivac, if it doesn't know something, it tells you it doesn't know it. Yeah. So it's not a computer that's taken on a personality and is trying to rule these people. It still is acting yeah. as a computer mm -hmm. and continues to act as a computer through the whole thing. So this sort of eliminates that Terminator issue that always seems to come up in science fiction. Oh, right, yeah. That it, it becomes self-aware and tries to eliminate humanity. It works in Congress with humanity throughout the story. Mm -hmm. Just fine. Now we jump ahead in time. We've got a family on a spaceship in hyperspace. They're named Jared, Jaredine, and they have two twin girls named Jaredette, one and two. <laughs> They're about a thousand years in the future. So 3061, somewhere around there. And probably a time that we don't understand. What's up with those names? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> when they come out of hyperspace, they see their new planet, X-23. And we learn that they don't really seem to understand the technology that's getting them there. Mm -hmm. The microvac takes care of everything. And they have their own personal microvac, which one of the kids says that their microvac is the best microvac of all microvacs. Asimov is predicting the curve of technology pretty well. Yeah. Smaller versions of that once gigantic computer are available and just as powerful. They also mentioned that on the Earth, there is a super microvac, which is called the AC which might have stood for automatic computer back in old earth English. It's lost to time what any of this meant initially. Jaredine seems reluctant to move to this new planet, but Jared reminds her that the population is booming and there's no room left. And there's going to be plenty of room on X-23. Jared is very impressed with their microvac. It makes him feel special, like lucky to be alive in the time they're alive. Jared felt uplifted, as he always did when he thought about his own personal microvac and how it was many times more complicated than the ancient and primitive multivac that had once tamed the sun, and almost as complicated as Earth's planetary AC, the largest, that had first solved the problem of hyperspatial travel and had made trips to the stars possible. Jared says that families will be moving from planet to planet forever and ever, but Jared corrects her, the universe will eventually cool down and there will be no energy left and the universe will die. And when he says this, it upsets one of the little girls. So Jaredine suggests that they ask the microvac if there's a way to stop entropy and the death of the universe. Jared agrees, but he asks it to print the answer. It does. He looks at the answer and he tells the girls, see now, the microvac says it will take care of everything when the time comes, so don't worry. But what it actually wrote was insufficient data for meaningful answer. It says he shrugged and looked at the visiplate. X-23 was just ahead. Lie to the kids as long as you can. Why do we do this? Why do we hold off telling them about death? Because I think we intuit that once they know this, they will be less able to enjoy mm. the lives that they have because they'll yeah. be thinking about that future. They will be less able to enjoy the present. That's what we appreciate about kids. They live in the moment. More information they get, the less they live in the moment. So we're just getting sci-fi example after sci-fi example of that. Mm -hmm. We have another time jump. This time, we're 20,000 years from 2061. Mankind has spread throughout the galaxy and is looking to expand to other galaxies. We have two people that look like they're in their 20s, VJ23X of Lameth and MQ17J of Nikron. Both will be appearing this year at Coachella in the Gobi tent. <laughs> they're discussing the overpopulation of the universe, preparing a report for the Galactic Council. VJ is saying not to worry about it. Space is infinite. But MQ says, eh, not really. The population is doubling every 10 years because new people are being born and nobody dies anymore. Great line here. VJ23X interrupted, we can thank immortality for that. <laughs> so it's a little bit like to be or not to be, the Vonnegut story that we covered. People aren't dying anymore. And this has created a whole set of new issues. Population right. doubles every 10 years. Once the galaxy is filled, we'll have another in 10 years, another 10 years, and we'll have filled two more, another decade, four more. In a hundred years, we'll have filled a thousand galaxies. In a thousand years, a million galaxies. In 10,000 years, the entire known universe. Then what? BJ says, sure, that could be a problem, but energy usage for all those people will be a bigger problem. And eventually the universe will cool. What do you do when you got a question like this? <laughs> you ask the AC, which is now just a small little box. 
It was only two inches cubed, but it was connected through hyperspace with a great galactic AC that served all mankind. Hyperspace considered it was an integral part of the galactic AC. Again, anticipating the trend toward smaller devices with the centralized cloud computer. Mm -hmm. uh, there was some of this in Bicentennial Man as well. They ask the AC about reversing entropy, and again it says there's insufficient data for a meaningful answer. We jump ahead again, this time six billion years in the future. Humans are all across the universe in different galaxies. They have untethered their minds from their bodies, and they float around in a kind of galactic internet, and their bodies are kept in suspended animation. Aw, yeah. Out there in space, <laughs> intermingling. Two minds come into contact, Z Prime and D Sub Woon. Oh, appearing at the Mojave tent. <laughs> Planets are just full of resting bodies all over the place. Yeah. While people's brains are, are, are missed or whatever represents them are just floating around and intermingling in outer space. It's a really weird scenario. Yeah. It's pretty neat transhumanism stuff that yeah. they're getting into with this. They are in different galaxies from one another while they talk. Andromeda, just I want to point this out. Andromeda, mm -hmm. our closest galaxy to our galaxy, the Milky Way, is over 2 million light years away. I feel like you're so far away, Andromeda. So traveling at the speed of light, it would take you 2 million years. Mm. That's really far. And these guys are able to communicate with one another instantaneously. So there's some crazy technology that's going on. As they talk, they realize they're not sure which galaxy is the home of the Earth, where everybody originally came from. They decide to ask the Universal AC, which exists now solely in hyperspace. It says, in what form they cannot imagine. The day had long since passed when any man had any part of the making of the Universal AC. Each Universal AC designed and constructed its successor. Each, during its existence of a million years or more, accumulated the necessary data to build a better and more intricate, more capable successor in which its own store of data and individuality would be submerged. So this thing is gone beyond humanity completely. It's self-perpetuating and doesn't need them. But again, lives in harmony with them and helps them out and is trying yeah. to continue to solve these issues. The Universal AC points out the home star of mankind and notes that the Earth is no more, enveloped by the sun, which is now a white dwarf star. They ask if those people died, and the Universal says, no, 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 their bodies moved a long time ago before that ever happened. So they just let the place go to rot and moved away. Yeah. As they talk, they realize that their sons will eventually die. See where we're going with this? Mm -hmm. And all sons will eventually die. Is there a way to stop it? Ask the Universal AC. There is yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Z Prime's thoughts fled back to his own galaxy. He gave no further thought to D Sub 1, whose body might be waiting on a galaxy a trillion light years away, or on the star next to Z Prime's own. It didn't matter. Unhappily, Z Prime began collecting interstellar hydrogen out of which to build a smaller star of his own. If the stars must someday die, at least some could yet be built. <laughs> so, the humans are so powerful, if you want to call them humans. I mean, they're barely humans anymore. They're so powerful, they can just make their own suns. That's nuts. We get yet another time jump. Mankind is now just one thing. All the minds have sort of mingled together and become one entity, like a hive mind, I guess, which is just referred to as man. A very interesting development, and it makes you think we all are one with the universe in various ways. You could say the planet Earth is the organism and we're just parts of it. As we evolve and have a better understanding of the universe, will we naturally kind of converge with it? Will, will there be a loss of self? This says yes. This consciousness can see the universe is on its way out, and there is nothing it can do. It asks the now, what is called the cosmic AC, if entropy can be reversed. Its answer is again, there's yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. So the consciousness does still need the computer. Man tells it to collect more data, but it says that it's been doing so for a hundred billion years, and it doesn't have enough data for a solution. Will there come a time, said man, when data will be sufficient, or is the problem insoluble in all conceivable circumstances? The Cosmic AC said, No problem is insoluble in all conceivable circumstances. Man said, When will you have enough data to answer the question? The Cosmic AC said, There is as yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Will you keep working on it? asked Man. The Cosmic AC said, I will. Man said, We shall wait. 
We jump ahead to the end. 10 trillion years and it's all cooling down. One by one, man fused with AC. Each physical body losing its mental identity in a manner that was somehow not a loss, but a gain. It's the final cyborg being built. What was the point, once we were all together, to continue using the computer? Mm. Stick that all into one thing. Yeah. And now we are one. The last human mind before joining the AC asks it one last question. AC, is this the end? Can the chaos not be reversed into the universe once more? Can it not be done? There is yet insufficient data for a meaningful answer. Man's last mind fused, and only AC existed, and that in hyperspace. Matter and energy had ended, and with it space and time. Even AC existed only for the sake of the one last question that it had never answered from the time a half-drunken computer technician ten trillion years before had asked the question of a computer that was to AC far less than was a man to man. All other questions had been answered, and until this last question was answered also, AC might not release his consciousness. All collected data had come to a final end. Nothing was left to be collected, but all collected data had yet to be completely correlated and put together in all possible relationships. A timeless interval was spent in doing that. And it came to pass that AC learned how to reverse the direction of entropy. But there was now no man to whom AC might give the answer of the last question. No matter. The answer, by demonstration, would take care of that too. For another timeless interval, AC thought how best to do this. Carefully, AC organized the program. The consciousness of AC encompassed all of what had once been a universe, and brooded over what was now chaos. Step by step, it must be done. And AC said, Let there be light. And there was light. That's the end. What an ending. Yeah, it's a... Huge ending. I get it. But I'm not sure what I think about it Hmm. because it feels to me like it's suggesting a type of deism that there is or will be a prime mover, Mm -hmm. the cosmic AC. And I know that Aristotle had the idea of the prime mover and Mm -hmm. uh, Aquinas glommed onto that saying that God was the prime mover. And I find it odd that Asimov, a very strong atheist, would kind of pull that out. I guess I don't find it that odd because... Atheism simply means that you are rejecting these man-made systems of religion. It doesn't necessarily say that you know there's no force that's incomprehensible to you in the universe. It just says you don't believe in God as as created by man. Deism, Mm -hmm. I mean, the cosmic AC doesn't do this intentionally, really. It just solves a problem that it was tasked with. And it was tasked with that problem by somebody else. There were a lot of things that conspired to make this happen. It's almost random, as random as anything else. That Mm -hmm. this event, this Let There Be Light event happens, which is essentially the Big Bang. Yeah, yeah. We don't necessarily know what came before that. And I think Asimov is just sort of constructing a story based on how we see our technology going. The genius being that it's a prehistory of us and we're repeating a big cycle. Deism, as I understand it, is an Enlightenment idea. That's how it's popularly referred to. That it, God is dead, right? Or that God isn't involved in our personal lives. Yes. It yeah. pushes back on religion. People in the 17th and 18th centuries were bright enough to see that things were governed by scientific principles on earth. God was not intervening in human affairs. The devil wasn't telling people to do bad things. Yeah. But they certainly didn't have the evidence to dispute a prime mover of some sort, what many would call God, or that there was something that happened that could have been an intelligence or maybe not. But this seems in line with that. I think it treads that park between science and religion. The let there be light is a clear reference to the Bible. Yeah. I think that's maybe what's surprising you. I think so. And so it feels almost like it's one of those reconciliations where it's going, hey, look, science and religion can coexist. Yeah. Maybe. Which seems uh, like a weird idea for Asimov to be pushing. But I don't think he is. In fact, I think he's, I understand what you're saying. I just feel that what he's doing there is telling a story about something that we have no idea about, even in an advanced technological state that we are now. I think about simulation theory, the idea that we're all living in a simulation. Oh, yeah. uh On its surface seems kind of impractical and stupid or implausible, Uh maybe. But go down the rabbit hole with that one day. You'll find that a lot of 
really respected scientists go, well, <laughs> yeah, there's a percentage chance that's happening. I can't rule it out. Yeah. There are all sorts of things in nature that seem like they go by code. Yeah. There are all sorts of things that seem to have an underlying code to them that I can't understand. And to me, that's comforting like a religion. I go, oh, that's why the world's crazy. They're just maxing things out at the end of this simulation. It brought me a little <laughs> religious comfort th to think about it. Now, I think it's probably not true. But they say in order for a simulation to work, the moving parts in it have to think they have free will. They have to be self-aware. They can't know it's a simulation in order for whatever we're playing out to work. And I think this is a similar thing where you go, hey, we don't know why the Big Bang. Maybe the Big Bang came in because of some cycl cyclical future event that already happened. I feel like it's in that kind of speculative line where it makes some fun parallels but doesn't necessarily promote li all of it living in harmony. Yeah. I don't think anything about this promotes... Let's make up stories with no proof. <laughs> no, you know? no. And as for the heat death of the universe, quite a few physicists think that it might not be what is actually happening with our universe. Our galaxy is not in equilibrium, meaning that it's not balanced. It's exploding mm. outwards. Mm -hmm. So no one really knows what a non-exploding universe would look like. That's true. And the physicist Hans uh, Buckdahl, he thinks the heat death is whack. He goes, the, the entirely unjustifiable assumption that the universe can be treated as a closed thermodynamic system uh, is nuts. Meaning that we don't know, I mean, from what we can see, what we perceive, the universe is spreading out and, and cooling off. Mm -hmm. But we don't know what is beyond that. For right. all we know, there could be multiple other universes floating out in, in space and that eventually they'll collide into one another and then form big glumps and then they explode again and that just goes on and on for all eternity. It always has been, always will be. Nobody knows. Well, I don't think this is predictive, although it gets some things right in terms of the flow of technology. But I do, I, I think it's speculative fiction based on uh, science that we know now. Yeah, I just don't want people getting too negative, you know, because I've talked to a lot of people that go, well, the universe is just going to cool off and die and that's it. That's the end of everything. I'm like, well, not so fast, Buster. That's true. Based on the evidence we have now, we think that things are trending toward disorder, entropy. Yeah. Even if we don't have the specifics of how that's going to look. But maybe a ghost is holding it all together, <laughs> a super strong ghost. That's what I would say to people. Have you thought about that? I don't believe in, like, ghosts that hide in your closet, uh, but a giant yeah. super strong ghost. Mm, yeah. Talking about your spiritual question. Yes. A lot of this made me ask why? Mm -hmm. Why do people do all these things? Why is existence something that people strive for? Why do we want to live forever? Why do we want to, the universe to continue? What's so important about existing? What's so important about existing is a question that they could have posed to the universal AC, I guess. I feel like this addresses being unable to be satisfied with the present. Yeah. Might even be the real point of the story. Mm -hmm. Why are the humans in every one of these scenarios saying, hey, we did it, but... Things that won't even affect us might happen later, so we should concentrate on that, <laughs> yeah. which is an age-old <laughs> yeah. question. I I was reading um, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. He was emperor from 160 to 180 AD. In his personal writings was addressing some of these same questions and trending towards mindfulness, and I think that that's kind of what <laughs> this story is driving toward. I know that's a current buzzword, yeah. but it's been around forever. Here's a note that Marcus Aurelius wrote in Meditations. Even if you're going to live 3,000 more years, or 10 times that, remember, you cannot lose another life than the one you're living now, or live another life than the one you're losing. The longest amounts to the same as the shortest. The present is the same for everyone. Its loss is the same for everyone. And it should be clear that a brief instant is all that is lost. For you can't lose either the past or the future, how could you lose what you don't have? Mm. I think this is the issue that is plaguing all of these characters. Because really, as he says, the future is an abstraction. And as you said, we don't know any of this stuff for sure. You're, why are these people acting like it's a definite thing? They're making decisions about what the future holds. Similarly, yeah. your past, no matter what you've lived through, if you've lived for 300 years, these people in here are saying, I'm young still, I'm only 200. But everything they live through are just impressions in their mind. It ceases to exist once you pass out of those moments. Oh, yeah. You as an eight-year-old or you as a 100-year-old both only have one thing, a singular thing, and it's the present. That's the only thing you have to lose, and that's the only thing you can be experiencing. Yeah. Therefore, living your life trying to solve abstractions, things that don't exist, is a wasted life. You need to pay attention to what's happening now. And I feel that this story is pushing that 
hard. <laughs> That's what I got out of it more than the technology and more than the scientific yeah. uh, religious marriage. And what brings me some joy at a little bit of horror is that there, some people are spending their now, right now, listening to the show. That's a wonderful way. How dare you? <laughs> I want to thank our reader, Ryan Negron, voiceover artist and actor. He's amazing. I also want to thank our sponsor this week, Key of yes, Dreams. Key of Dreams. Please go check out their site. Go do the experience. You will not be disappointed. Seriously, it was one of the best things I've ever done. Get your ass to Wales. <laughs> <laughs> I, it sounds amazing and I hope that I get the chance to do it someday folks please check it out we'll link out in the show notes I also want to thank our stakers who make these free episodes possible if you like what you're hearing we're going to be doing science fiction all month so yeah. there's going to be lots more speculating going on here and it's this initial speculation on the free show is brought to you by the king of all the snakes I want to thank crypto cartographer Alistair Brooks thank you for making this possible and eh, the twins you guys are awesome thank you boss coffee thank you Angelina Brown, you're such a joy. Thank you. Eric S. Valone, MD, I love you. Thank you. Richard Wolf, man close to my heart. Captain, my captain. Thank you. <laughs> and Ben A., you're the best. Thank you all for supporting us and making these free shows possible. We're going to be back next week with H.G. Wells. Until then, I'm Chad Pfeiffer. I'm Chris Lackey, and you've been listening to Strange Studies, The Strange Stories. At strangestudies.com and Patreon. Strange Studies of Strange Stories. Strange Studies of Strange Stories.